Good afternoon and welcome to Sensors Daily's webinar, Spin Pad Sensors Outperform VR Resolvers in Terms of Economy, Functionality and Flexibility in Hybrid Electric Powertrains, presented by Matthias Knock, Product Man Application Manager for Speed Sensors at AB Electronique, a NVX Group company. I'm Matt Durgis, Editor-in-Chief of Sensors Daily Online, and I will be your host and moderator for today's webinar. AB Electronics spin pad rotor position sensors provide hybrid electric powertrains with economical, functional, and flexible alternatives to VR resolvers. These sensors integrate active electronics that allows them to support redundant system designs, meeting safety requirements as per ISO 26262. They solve accuracy issues common to VR resolvers, reach maximum speeds up to 100,000 RPM, depending on the number of pole pairs in the motors, and provide digital or analog output signals in line with standards ranging from ISO 26262 to ASILC with one channel or ASILD with a redundant system. Before we begin, there are just two items I need to bring to your attention. First, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. However, feel free to submit your questions during the presentation via the Zoom interface, and we will get to them in order at the end. Also, should we run out of time before we get to all your questions, we can have them answered via email later. Contact information for the presenter will be available in your chat box during the Q&A session. Second, the webinar is being recorded and will be available later this week on the Sensors Daily website and our YouTube channel. Now, without further verbosity, I'll hand the mic over to Matthias Knock. Yeah, hello everyone, and uh, well, thanks to Matt for the introduction. Um, first of all, please let me know if you can't hear me or if I'm having any issues concerning the audio quality or the connection so that I can stop or repeat the part of the presentation. I appreciate everybody joining in for our webinar today. And before we dive in a little bit about myself, um, my name is Matthias Knoche and um, I am the responsible product application manager for the product group of speed sensors here at AB Electronic. I'm with AB Electronic for almost six years now, starting out as a project manager. And um, since mid of 2017, I have taken over the product portfolio of speed sensing. I'm located in Werne, Germany, which is close to Dortmund or Münster. So this is the Western part of Germany. And as a product application manager, my main focus is to make sure that our products within the group of speed sensors are able to compete in the current market from well, performance and cost wise, and to capture the voice, the voice of the customer to ensure that our products um, meet the customer requirements and that we are also able to adapt uh, to future market needs. So in today's webinar, I would like to take you on a short journey and explain to you how and why our spin pad technology is able to outperform conventional VR resolvers in terms of economy, functionality, and flexibility. In case you're not familiar with the term VR resolver, you might be wondering what I'm talking about at all. Um, well, to keep things short in this introduction, try to imagine a sensor inside of an electric motor whose only task is to determine the exact position of the rotor shaft within this motor. This information is crucial to drive the motor with the highest possible efficiency and to enable a long range for the vehicle. To put it into other words, the correct technical term for VR resolvers or spin pad sensors is a rotor position sensor. With these kinds of sensors, it is possible to measure the exact position of a rotating element at high speeds of up to 100,000 RPM and convert this information into a signal format that can be evaluated and analyzed by control units. So before diving into the technical details and explanations um, to make you more familiar with rotor position sensing and our spin pad technology, I would like to give you a short introduction to our company and uh, what we are actually doing. With this kind of background, you should be able to understand why it was important to expand um, our product portfolio with a new line of sensors and the specialized production process to ensure competitiveness in the market. After that, I will focus on rotor position sensing itself and try to paint you a better picture why our technology gives us a head start for this new emergent market of hybrid electric powertrains for the automotive industry. So a little bit about AB Electronic in general. Um, our portfolio of speed sensors is driven by the so-called center of excellence in Werner. Um, so for over 30 years, Werner is the home base for the product process and manufacturing engineering. 
the Werner facility has approximately 450 employees and an area of uh, roughly 30,000 square meters in total. And production locations for speed sensors are located in India, China, Mexico, and well, of course, in Germany. Um, we also have uh, R&D departments in India and China as well. Most of our sensor business is customized, meaning that we develop customer specific, uh, specific sensors according to customer specific requirements. Although we do have a standard standardized portfolio, our main revenue driver are customer specific solutions and most of our customers are automotive based. So the big OEMs like VW, Daimler, BMW and so on. So the brand or the company AB Electronic forms the so-called business unit sensing and control within the, um, the AVX organization. As, and within this business unit, the products are divided into two main categories. So we have the sensors, as you can see on the top of the slide, um, and the control units at the bottom of this slide. And the, the main products for the sensor divisions are, for example, position sensors, uh, simple position sensors. They are mainly used in height applications, for, for so chassis height, height applications. Um, temperature sensors, which are mainly used in exhaust applications, and well, for example, driver demand controls, you might know them as accelerator pedal modules or pedals. Uh, and within the control division, the products are more focused on controlling certain elements within automotive applications rather than sensing signals. Um, so for example, we have the MCU, so the motor control unit for electrical in-wheel drive systems or LED lighting modules, for example. So for, the t um, for today's presentation, I will focus on the product group of speed sensors within the sensing division, which is highlighted um, well, by the green square. Before diving into technical details, um, I would like to give you a short overview about speed sensing in general, including the possible applications and future challenges. With this kind of background, um, you should or you, you will understand why it was necessary to rework our portfolio of speed sensing and um, to adapt to future market needs to ensure a company profit profitability. Speed sensors in the automotive industry are broadly used in engine and transmission applications to support safety, comfort and emission functions. And AB Electronic itself um, has supplied the automotive industry with customized solutions since uh, the 1980s. So this is for almost 40 years now. And well, you can imagine that we have a lot of well uh, knowledge and patents concerning speed sensing technologies. Um, our annual global production of speed sensors peaks at about 10 million parts with a failure rate of less than three parts per million. Um, our speed sensors have specialized functionalities like direction detection or true power on. Um, these functions used to be a unique selling points for, for speed sensors. Um, however, classic speed sensors such as crank or camshaft sensors are be becoming more and more commodity as well, almost every supplier has the potential to include such functionalities. Um, yeah. And as already stated before, most of the sensors that we are developing are customer driven and specifically developed to fit the customer requirements and the customer installation space. So in order to keep things a little bit simple in my vocabulary, I refer to these well, speed sensors as classic speed sensors, which sense the speed of target wheels, such as camera crankshafts. Based on the current market trends and discussions concerning the conservation of the environment and the resources, and the resources, the well-known combustion engine um, grows less popular and the focus continues to shift towards alternative driving concepts. And whether we are talking about fuel cell or battery powered vehicles, the biggest common denominator is always the electric motor. Although classic speed sensors are sometimes used within electric motors, for example, to sense the speed of the output shaft, another sensor is of fundamental importance, and this is the so-called resolver or the rotor position sensor. So to put it into other words, um, in order to compete in any future automotive market, we as AB Electronic had to adapt our product portfolio to the current market trends and take a closer look at the current resolver technologies to develop the next generation of potential rotor position sensors. The technical background for rotor position will be described in more detail on the following slides. But before jumping to the technical stuff, let us have a short look at the market trends and why AB Electronic has decided to focus on rotor position sensing. 
So on this slide, I dig a little deeper into the ongoing market change and projection into the future um, up until 2040 in regards to the worldwide powertrain electrification. Um, and these graphs that are shown on this slide are based on a case study by Bloomberg NEF, um, which was released almost exactly one year ago. And based on this study, it is expected that by 2040, 57% um, of all passenger vehicle sales and just over 30% of the global passenger vehicle fleet will be electric. A price parity between electric vehicles and vehicles with internal combustion engines was expected by the mid of 2020. So in most segments, and so from a today's standpoint, this projection or this thesis has almost proven valid, uh, valid if we take a look at the pricing of upcoming electric vehicles by big OEMs. Two major factors influence the actual share of annual sales of electric vehicles in a big way. First of all, the above mentioned price parity and secondly, the growth of the available infrastructure which is needed for electric vehicles. So as shown in figure two on the right side, the, um, the electric vehicle adoption accelerates from 2024 onwards before slowing down in the 2030s as charging infrastructure avail availability holds back the market. Potential buyers with access to home charging, of course, will go electric at a much faster rate than, the, than those without. However, what I'm trying to show with this slide and these colorful graphs um, is the excessive growth of electrified and hybrid powertrains within the next 20 years. And linked with this growth is a rising demand for cost-effective and high-performance solutions. So to be able to enter this market, our whole company was forced to look at potential applications in electrified powertrains where we as a company could position ourselves in regards to our competition. As already mentioned before, there's a global trend to significantly reduce CO2 emissions. This global trend is backed and supported by the legislation as shown in the pictures. And I don't want to drift too far into the details and take those numbers apart that you can see on the slide. Um, I just want to give you a feeling that the legal emission limits are decreasing by a significant amount. And the electric and hybrid powertrains, they hold great promises and potential to achieve these legal limits. And thus the trend concerning electrification of powertrains has picked, with an, has picked up with an aggressive speed in the last couple of years. And this, of course, as already mentioned, yields a big demand for any electric vehicle components in the upcoming years. So AB Electronic um, has actually quite a long history concerning inductive sensing. In fact, AB was one of the first companies to introduce an inductive-based accelerator pedal module to the automotive market around the beginning of the new century, which was somewhere in 2004. And this inductive base pedal replaced pedals uh, with uh, sliding contacts. And back in the days, this was a huge improvement concerning reliability and product costing. And since then, the R&D knowledge and capabilities have continu continually evolved. And by today, most of the automotive sensors are inductive based. So with the knowledge of the previous slides, it should become clear why it was important to choose a new field of business, which, was, which has the greatest possible intersections with electrified driving or electrified vehicles. And due to the past concerning inductive sensing for AB, it was a logical step to enter the market for inductive-based rotor position sensing. And out of this demand, the so-called spin pad technology was born, aiming to oust conventional VR resolvers. So, um, to put it into simple words, the, the speed sensor group or the portfolio of the speed sensor group can be divided into two main categories. So we have the classic speed sensors on the left for sensing uh, camera crankshaft um, signals. And we have the spin pad or rotor position sensing on the right. So as mentioned on the previous slide, uh, we have a long history concerning inductive sensing. And in order to paint you a better picture, I would like to shed some light on what kind of sensor we have been, sensors we have been using the inductive technology on. So our inductive technology is called AutoPad and it was introduced um, in the beginning of 2004, as I mentioned already um, in the first pedals where a rotating target is being sensed by the corresponding antenna structure. This technology was then transferred to the position sensor. You can see them down here, uh, mainly for height level sensing, as I already said, for chassis applications, and was recently further developed to use it, use it in either linear applications. So this is a technology that we are calling SimsPad, or for rotational systems um, for, for SpinPad with higher bandwidths um, to make it suitable for rotor position sensing. 
In 2018, AB has reached a big milestone of delivering more than 100 million sensors into the field, equipped with the inductive AutoPad technology. And uh, by 2019, we were actually able to double this number. So we are talking about more than 200 million um, sensors in the field with this kind of technology. Well, and due to this long history, the internal knowledge concerning inductive sensing is quite high and all development work that we are doing is completely done in-house. So we're talking about the electronic layout, the coil design, the testing, the validation. Um, we do it out of one hand. So the functionality and effectiveness of electric motors and driver assistance systems depend directly on the reliability of sensors which convert physical variables such as speed or position into electrical signals and transmit them to the control unit. The measured value of, of the rotor position is a key parameter in driving an electric motor because the more precise this value is, the more efficiently the motor can be controlled. And thus, higher ranges of the potential vehicle can be realized. Or, or to put it into other words, the more efficient an electric motor can be driven, the better the mileage and the emission of the vehicle in the complete life cycle. Therefore, it should become clear why the rotor position sensor is such an important component in the complete measurement chain of an electric motor or the whole, whole vehicle. So there are a lot of different approaches to measure the exact rotor position inside an electric motor, but only two have become generally accepted. Um, and the most common sensor is the so-called VR resolver, which is shown on the left side. So the bottom three parts that you can see right here, those are VR resolvers. And VR stands for variable reluctance, and it should be self-explanatory since it is also based on an inductive measurement principle. The two most characteristic features of VR resolvers can be summarized as follows. First of all, these are passive mechanical components, meaning that there are no active electronics included within the sensor, and therefore it is not possible to realize any self-diagnostic functions. This is only possible by the means of signal evaluation in the control unit, and the software needs to be adapted accordingly. Secondly, VR resolvers can only be implemented or realized in a 360 degree topology or configuration, meaning that the sensor will always be in a closed circle around the rotor shaft. And this, of course, has um, major disadvantages concerning installation space, mounting, and pricing. The SpinPad technology addresses exactly these problematic characteristics of VR resolvers. Possible layouts or sensor layouts are shown on the right-hand side of the screen. And um, I will present possible more possible de design options later on. Um, the SpinPad so forms the next generation of rotor position sensors and it eliminates the weaknesses of the previous generation. In general, these kind of sensors use an eddy current measuring method but this will be described in more detail on the next slide. These are active sensors and accordingly self-diagnostic functions, which are important for applications which have certain functional safety requirements, can be implemented. Furthermore, the restriction concerning the 360 degree topology, which I mentioned for the VR resolver, this is lifted and segmented sensors are possible. And this has a massive advantage concerning installation space, pricing, mounting, and repairability. So basically, the spin pad technology uses the principle of electromagnetic induction. Since electromagnetic induction requires an alternating magnetic field, the system is fundamentally immune to static magnetic fields, such as permanent magnets and motors. The sensor comprises of a stationary transmit coil, the TX coil, and two stationary receive coils, the RX coils, and the moving target, um, as shown in the figure on the right-hand side of the slide. So you can see the target up here, and we have a PCB where the TX, so the transmit coil, is embedded, and the RX coils are available. The transmit coil and the receive coils are usually arranged on a printed circuit board, offering a low-cost product. The geometry of the receive coils is such that one coil produces a sine waveform and the other produces a cosine waveform in response to a rotational motion of the target, yielding a corresponding angular position for the target. The target is either metal, preferably non-magnetic, or a patterned PCB, and it moves in a plane parallel to the coil structure. An IC drives the transmit coil and interfaces the receive coils. 
the frequency of the current in the transmit coil is of the order of several megahertz and this alternating current generates an electromagnetic field which induces eddy currents in the moving target. These eddy currents in turn generate an ele electromagnetic field that induces a current in the receiver coils. As the target moves, the high frequency component of the voltage of the current from this cosine and cosine coil is amplitude modulated by the geometry of the coils. This yields lower frequency sine and cosine waveforms, which represent the position of the target. The coupling or the mutual inductance between the target and the coils varies as a sine and cosine function of the target's position. So the coupling between the target and the transmit coil is a constant function of position. And with a simple Arcus-Tangus operation, it is then uh, possible to calculate the exact position of the rotor. So on this slide, I will give you a short overview concerning the spin pad technology with its key facts and applications. As already stated before, a spin pad sensor is actually nothing more than a rotor position sensor or a contactless, a contactless inductive position sensor, which is based on the AutoPad technology. And rotor position sensing has always been a very important market, market sector, but with the current rise of electric vehicles in the automotive industry, this type of technology becomes more important with each day. And the main focus switches from functional requirements to commercial points. Typical, typical applications are the replacement of the well already presented um, VR resolver. Um, and these re VR resolvers are mainly mechanical parts, as I already described without any active electronics on board. VR resolvers can be seen at the top of this page in the red square once again. And these parts are rather simple, but expensive due to the large sizes, materials, and complex production processes. VR resolvers will be located in the side of an electric motor to sense the exact position of the rotor. And this information is crucial and needed by the ECU, so the electronic control unit, to drive this electric motor. And as already mentioned on the previous slide, the more accurate and more reliable this information is, the more efficient the motor can be driven. So therefore, possible applications of spin pad sensors are all electric motors, which are used in the automotive industry or industrial applications. Compared to current rotor position sensors, the spin pad parts have a very thin form factor, we have very high magnetic immunity and many assemble options, as can be seen on the right side on the, in this green square. And some more design options will be presented later on. And due to the fact that um, spin pad sensors are active parts or active components, it is possible to design redundant system to meet requirements concerning safety critical applications. So as Matt has already said in the introduction, um, we are referring to the ISO 26262. And the target design is highly flexible from PCBs to fully metallic targets. The main characteristics of pin spin pad sensors are very are a very high accuracy of points up of up to 0.3 degrees. Well, but please don't um, take me too seriously on these numbers because those numbers always depend on the customer applications yeah? um, and on the design of the sensor itself. But um, under perfect conditions, it is possible to reach this number and the maximum speed of up to 100,000 RPM, which is also highly dependent on the number of pole pairs of the electric motor. And as already mentioned, the readiness for functional safety up to ASL C with a one channel system or the ASL D with a redundant system. So, concerning the possible output formats, the analog signal is currently standard on the market, and the spin pad technology is able to, to provide um, analog signals in either a single ended or differential ended manner. And to be properly positioned for the future, our R&D advanced development department is working closely with our customers to define the next standard in terms of digital output formats. So protocols like SPI, SEND or SPC are possible. So here you can see a general comparison of technologies between VR resolvers and the spin pad sensors. VR resolvers use heavy materials uh, such as steel or copper and will always need to be designed in 360 degree shape around the rotor, as already mentioned before. Any other topology is not possible due to the measurement principle of these rotor position sensors. In direct comparison with a spin pad sensor, the size and weight of VR resolvers is much larger. And this, of course, depends on each application in detail and cannot be generalized, but due to the flexibilities that can be achieved during the design phase and the later production processes, the advantages of a spin pad sensor concerning size and weight will always outweigh any VR resolver. 
in direct comparison to a VR resolver from, ele um, from an electric motor out of a modern car, like a Tesla, for example, um, it is roughly, just a rough number, 10 to 30 percent, that VR resolver is 10 to 30 percent more expensive than a comparable spin pad sensor. But of course, these final numbers heavily depend on a lot of factors, like volumes, functional safety requirements, accuracy requirements, and so on. What I'm trying to say is that uh, with a spin pad sensor, significant cost savings are possible. The accuracy of a spin pad sensor is comparable to VR resolvers. And as our cars become more and more intelligent and the functionalities concerning autonomous driving uh, are becoming more important with each, day, with each day, it is absolutely necessary for any sensor to meet functional safety goals to guarantee a safe and predictable, pr predictable behavior of the vehicle in failure situations. So with a VR resolver, this is not possible. Um, since these are mechanical parts with passive electronics on board. Spin pad sensors, however, are um, equipped with active electronic components. And as I already mentioned before, um, with a redundant system, you are able to reach the highest possible level of ASL D. So as described on the previous slides, the typical spin pad topology um, comprises of a rotating target and a fixed antenna structure. Shown in the figure above are the three main topologies for a spin, si spin pad system. So we are talking about a through-hole system, um, the end of shaft system, or a segment system. So in these uh, um, graphs or in these illustrations, the bluish area or the darker area is representing the antenna structure or the PCB area, and the gray area represents the target. Other topologies, such as those exploiting flexible PCBs or linear configurations or exotic arrangements, are also possible. Um, and each of those of these topologies shown utilizes a metal target, either as a separate unit fixed onto the rotating shaft or as a machine part to the shaft itself. Um, if a metal wheel is not feasible, then a pattern PCB or well, an alternative equivalent structure can be used as well. The number of cutouts or teeth, as we call them, so I'm talking about the cutouts right here or those, those teeth of the target, um, they correspond to the number of pole pairs and hence the number of electrical periods per mechanical period. So the target wheels that you can see right here are all for a three pole pair machine. The choice of sensor topology usually, usually comprises a trade-off of cost, required accuracy and tolerances, and application environment, so the location of the assembly requirements. A 360 degree system, so for example, a through hole on the end of shaft system, this design will always be more accurate than a segmented sensor, but this comes of course with a higher price. If the PCB area is a premium, then novel coil topologies or multi-layered PCB boards can be employed to accommodate this. Through-hole solutions give good performance and are thinner than VR systems, but usually have a higher material cost due to its size. End of shaft applications will usually give the best performance and cost value. They are small, so we are talking typically of a diameter of this rotor of less than 40 millimeters, outer diameter. And they, of course, have a 360 degree coil structure, which gives the best immunity to tolerances. When considering large applications, typically above 75 millimeter of rotor diameter, a segment PCB, so the illustration on the right hand side, is usually chosen. Um, the cost of either an equivalent through hole or end of shaft topology is just too large. So as already presented and described on the previous slide concerning the sensor design, the possible target design for spin pad sensors offers a wide range of flexibility as well. This enables the most effective solution in terms of cost and performance, making the best possible use of the available customer installation space. So, so the row of pictures, as you can see on, this, uh, on the top of this page, lists all technically possible target designs of, of the spin pad technology. So in some, we are talking about four general possible design layouts, whereby two different colors are used to distinguish between the target material and its outer contour. So the yellow or the darker yellowish um, color is supposed to represent the target material or the teeth on the finger, as we have, um, or as I have introduced on the last slide. 
the target material or the teeth will influence the generated electromagnetic field in a way that the sensor is able to sense this change. The greenish or the lighter color represents the target windows or where the area or the areas where the generated electric magnetic field is not supposed to be influenced by the target. For the first picture on the upper row, so I'm talking about this one right here, you could also describe this area as the carrier material since the target teeth are being supported by, are not, are being not supported by an inner or outer ring. Yeah? So, as you can see uh, with this design, there's an inner ring supporting the target teeth or we have an outer ring supporting the target teeth. And there's also the possibility to use an inner and outer ring to support or to generate the target design. To give you a better feeling how potential targets could look like, depending on the different design options, I included some in examples on the lower um, um, half of this slide. The first two targets on the lower hand of this slide can be characterized um, as the first design option, but with a general distinction that the carrier material is different. So the first blue target is being milled out of one piece of alum aluminum and the actual target structure or the teeth which influence the electromagnetic field are or is generated by a height profile or the rectangular elevations and thus the target and carrier material is the same. The second picture on the lower half of this side um, shows the PCB target where the target or the teeth, teeth structure is realized by the copper foil on the PCB top layer itself. And thus the target and the carrier materials are different. All other target designs um, are either supported by an inner or outer ring, as I mentioned before. And the variant with an inner support ring is probably the most common design, as can be seen in the lower half of the slide. So this would be, for example, this target design or this tar target design or, well, this one. As stated in the beginning of this presentation, I would also like to present a specialized production process to you, the so-called direct overmolding. This technology is nothing new and it's currently mostly being used in other areas such as the medical sector. Um, for automotive applications, this kind of technology is still quite new and therefore not much known. Key piece of this production technology is the, uh, technology is the complete overmolding of any components of the sensor with a thermoset material meaning that um, there are no sealing points or seams and thus for liquids it is not possible to enter the sensor since the sensor is made out of one piece. Compared to standard manufacturing processes, the direct overmolded parts have a much higher robustness since all sensitive electronics are completely embedded by the thermoset material. Environmental factors like humidity and mechanical stress can be minimized and the parts have an extreme high resistance against chemicals, extraordinary tightness, a hermetic cover against environmental influences, and the high mechanical and dimensional stability, even under high temperatures. And due to the almost identical expansion coefficient of thermoset and all mechanical in elements in the sensor, the internal stress level uh, is at a minimum. So this direct overmolding is made possible to, due to the low temperatures and the low pressure of thermoset material during the um, injection molding process, which avoids any damage to the electronic components. So for example, the SMD components or the ASICs. So in, 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 in the combination of uh, the direct overmolding with uh, our spin plate technology, um, the Direct overmelting technology can play out its advantages since rotor position sensors are mostly integrated as segmented sensors directly into the electric motor, meaning that the environmental requirements are quite high. For example, either sensors might be completely indulged in oil or you have an oil mist where other manufacturing processes reach their limits. So here you can see a direct, um, direct overmold direct overmolded spin pad sensor in an exploded view. Um, this should help you to understand this process, process technique a little bit more in detail. So um, in the first production step, um, the electronics and SMD components will be di directly populated onto the PCB. Um, and in the next product, on, in, in the next step, this assembly group then will be overmolded with thermoset material yielding the so-called pre-mold. So this is shown in the middle of this slide. Um, after this step, all electronic components are completely housed inside of thermoset material, forming a strong barrier against any environmental impacts. 
And as a final process step, the pre-mold is then again over-molded with thermoset material, with, uh, which then results in the final outer appearance of the sensor. The bushings are also part of this final process steps and they are being molded into place. Well, and then last but not least, the O-rings are applied to ensure tight seal towards the customer installation space. As already mentioned, this direct overmolding technique yields a completely encapsulated sensor in thermoset material, leaving no air inside the sensor and no seals on the outside. All electronic components are fully embedded, and since, as already mentioned, the expansion coefficient is very close to copper, there are no thermal problems during um, temperature stress. So on the last two slides of my presentation, I would like to give you a short overview of potential new applications that are only made possible with inductive rotor position sensing. As a first example, um, our engineers have integrated a spin pad sensor into a standard bearing, which yields a highly integrated, we call it smart bearing or a resolver bearing. If this bearing is mounted onto the rotor shaft of any system, it is possible to sense the exact rotor position while also fulfilling the general tasks of being a bearing. So well, this offers, of course, great advantages concerning the installation space and the number of individual parts in an electric motor since they can be reduced significantly. And since rotor shafts are usually supported at two points, it is also possible to realize a torque measurement if two resolver bearings are used on one rotor shaft. Well, and of course, all other features of the spin pad technology also apply for this smart bearing, such as the readiness, uh, the, the readiness for functional safety. Another very interesting application um, is a so-called sensor cluster, um, including an inductive rotor position sensor. So this um, 3D model represents a directly overmold pump actuation cover for automatic transmissions. And within this one cover, it is possible to include a rotor position sensor and additionally a temperature and pressure sensor. By using a highly integrated, by using this highly integrated sensor clusters um, or cluster, the potential end customers can avoid multiple single sensors and instead install, install one sensor cluster, which is able to fulfill all the requirements of a single sensor. And with this kind of highly integrative approach, potential end customers can save costs in their manufacturing process since it is no longer necessary to install multiple sensors in their systems. And furthermore, it is not necessary to source three sensors individually at a higher price than a sensor cluster, which has the same functionality. So before coming to the official end of this webinar and uh, after presenting a lot of different 3D models and pictures, I would also like to show you some pictures of actually working parts that have been built up in our prototype shop. So some of these designs might look familiar to you because um, I showed concept of 3D pictures of these um, in the presentation on earlier slides. And I would just like to point out that we have several different uh, prototype or engineering samples available. And if any one of you or your company should be interested in this kind of technology, we are very happy to support you. So, all right, um, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your, atten for your attention. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I will be happy, happy to start a short discussion or to answer any questions that you might be having. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Matthias. Now we have some questions for you. Uh, the first question comes from a gentleman named Mark, and he asks, is 22 millimeters the maximum bore size you can currently achieve? Um, I think he's referring to the, the size of the target. So um, no, it is not. So we have sensors um, with um, sizes of up to, I think, 22 centimeters currently. So there's no restriction in bore sizes for this kind of technology. It's just a cost factor. The larger the sensor gets, the more expensive it will get. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question here. In the presentation, it is mentioned that functional safety is supported up to ASILV, autom automotive safety integration level. With a spin pad sensor, how is it possible to reach this level of ASL, ASILV? And why is this not possible with a VR resolver? Yeah, a very great question. Um, thanks. Um, so in order to ensure a high functional safety in automotive applications, according to ASLD or ASILD, a redundant system design is necessary. So for spin pad sensors, this can be realized by two identical and galvanically isolated circuits 
um, meaning that two complete functional sensors are realized on one PCB. So if one of those sensors fails, there's always the fallback level with uh, full functionality available. And there's also the possibility to make this, to make plausibility checks between these two sensors enable, enabling self-diagnostic functions. So um, realizing or achieving a redundant, a redundant system with um, VR resolvers is quite complicated and would imply using two wound coils side by side or using certain windings of, of the VR resolver for each channel of the sensor, which would um, then in terms reduce the accuracy significantly. And this has also massive drawbacks concerning the installation space. Um, and additionally, the whole evaluation or plausibility check of the sensor signal needs to be realized um, with the uh, control unit, since VR resolvers are not capable of doing that due, due to the lack of active electronics. And um, therefore, it is not economically feasible to achieve any functional safety requirements with VR resolvers. And this is why active, sensor have, active sensors just have a massive advantage concerning functional safety. Okay, uh, Mark again asks, you mentioned two digital protocols, SPI Ascent, that's spelled A-S-C-E-N-T, and SBC. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a question mark. That's his, his question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so the current market standard uh, is uh, analog and we are developing with the potential um, um, well semiconductor suppliers the next digital output formats. And um, well, I would say that SPI, SEND or SPC are the current known standards for digital output formats. So there are, of course, other formats that will be available. Um, but since this kind of the technology is... Uh, quite new and young and has not a, reached a high maturity yet. Um, there hasn't been any defined standard for digital um, um, interfaces. So we are currently focusing on, on the digital output formats that are available and uh, well known on the market and uh, are trying to, to um, find the next standard with uh, this or in, in, in discussions with our customers. Okay, great. Uh, Luke wants to know, how does the cost compare against 3D hall sensors? Yeah, a very good question. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so a 3D hall sensor is, um, so it's then uh, um, like a magnetic based uh, rotor position sensor. And so from a cost point of view, I would say that they compare um, almost identical. Yeah. Um, it's just that uh, the magnetic or the GMR or 3D hall sensors for rotor position are more aimed at the mid-end of, of applications. Um, for example, um, for pump or for pumps, as I presented earlier, or uh, flaps and actuation motors. And for the high-end applications, as I would call them, so for traction motors or electronic power steerings, the inductive-based um, 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 sensors are more common. So I'd say from a price perspective, they should be almost comparing or uh, um, 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 uh, they should be almost close to the same. Okay, great. Uh, Mincy has a, a three-part question. The first part I can answer is, can we have a copy of this presentation? Yes, it will be available on the website uh, later today and uh, later this week on YouTube channel. Now, the other two parts are for you, Mateus. What is the maturity of this eddy current sensor in production and design validation tests completed? And do we have any dynamic gain control function implemented? Do we require uh, an inverter or implement any control algorithm? Yeah, so very good questions. Thank you. Um, so first of all, what is the maturity? So we are in serious development with um, a couple of customers for those sensors and we have um, at least two sensors in serious production with this kind of technology. So I would prove it as valid. Um, so we have, um, have our product validation finished and it is mature, this technology. And uh, concerning the gain control, so we have certain algorithms implemented in the IC that we are using. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail. There are certain algorithms which then need to be implemented in the control unit of the sensor itself. But um, well, to go into a deeper technical discussions, I would suggest um, to get in contact with me. Um, 
then we can set up like an NDA or something like that to get a, a better feeling for your questions. Um, but hopefully I was able to answer that um, from, a, from a general standpoint. Okay, great. And we also got one more question from Ming -Zi. Do we require uniform mounting background for the sensor? Um, also, very good question. Um, so it is not required to have a uniform back, uh, background mounting position or uh, um, the mounting location, but the um, so the overall installation space, so the surroundings of the sensors have an impact of, on, on the sensor performance. So when we develop um, such sensors, we always need the complete package from the customer in order to have um, this simulated uh, or put this in our simulation to um, to um, well develop the coil structure accordingly for the the well in installation space or the customer installation space, so it is always better to have a uniform background of the sensor, but it's not necessary. Yeah, but this then has to be done in in development work, that um, the 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 background of the sensor is put into the algorithms and and just analyzed how it influences the sensor signal and that the coil structures can be adapted accordingly to that. Okay, great. And we got time for one more question. Luke wants to know, is there a lower RPM limit? No, it's not. So actually the sensor um, works as soon as you turn the ignition on or the sensor is powered on. So as soon as um, the sensor sees any um, um, current or voltage, it uh, gives out this, uh, the sine and cosine signal so you can calculate the exact position of the rotor. So there's no lower RPM limit. Okay, great. Well, that's all we have time for today. I want to thank Mateus Kanaka and AB Electronique for a great presentation. And I want to thank all of our attendees for spending time with us today. Once again, a recording of this presentation will be available for download at sensorsdaily.com and our YouTube channel later this week. Be sure to register for our upcoming webinars and visit Sensors Daily for your daily dose of technology news. Thanks and have a great day.